Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of International Cannabis Conversations, brought to you by trichomes.com and hosted by the Global Cannabis Network Collective. We are so appreciative to Trichomes for allowing us to share the opportunity to take a look into what's driving global business landscape uh, for cannabis around the world and discuss international challenges, solutions, trials, lessons, and go behind the scenes of what leaders are thinking. Uh, we're really excited today to have with us the Chief Growth Officer and co-founder of Regenibus. Uh, Jeff Trotter lived in a number of places around the world. It's given him a really interesting global perspective on regenerative growth for all in the cannabis industry. And the first time I heard Jeff speak, uh, he was talking about impact investment and opportunities in the business landscape uh, for cannabis markets. And our subsequent offline talk uh, was particularly interesting because we were able to discuss a lot of the challenges from sort of the business uh, needs, legal barriers to capital raise issues around the world. Uh, and his background in financial markets prior to coming into cannabis uh, has made him uniquely skilled uh, to launch Regenibus. So, Jeff, I, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today for this. We get a chance to sort of lay the landscape and groundwork for what um, we are uh, looking forward to having as a place where people can come and really learn about uh, cannabis markets uh, around the world. So thanks for, for coming on. Well, thank you very much, both of you, Chris and Jill, for having me here. Um, I'm thrilled, frankly, the fact that I'm number one out the door. It's never happened before. Well, so somebody's got to be the guinea pig. never babe. too late. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> exactly. And we're excited that you accepted our, our proposition. More than happy. Delighted to be here. Well, we're really excited to talk to you today about uh, what it is that you and Regenibus uh, have as your mission. Um, I I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about what it is that you guys do. And if you could get into some of the, we've had some interesting talks before about the difference between the idea of sustainable, um, having a sustainable industry, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, and what you guys talk about. Uh, which I know the, the United Nations have been talking about too, which is more of a, a regenerative idea. So could you give us a, a brief intro about Regenibus and sustainability versus uh, regenerative ideas? Sure, yeah, um, I, I, can, I can do. And as I said, you know, it's, it's fantastic to be here and to give, you know, have the opportunity to sort of tell you a little bit more about Regenibus and our journey and what, we're, what we've set out to achieve I'm going to try to bring that all into something succinct and memorable. Um, Regenibus started a little under a year ago. Uh, it was a great time to start a business, of course, just about a week before we went into lockdown here in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and my co-founder and myself, Patrick McCartan, he'd been in the cannabis industry a little longer than I had been. Um, and we very quickly uh, learned to be uh, even more agile than we had hoped to be. We set out to, to really look at a, a different version of the cannabis industry from, what, from one that was sort of out the gate already, if, if you like. And one, by that, we mean it, it, there, was, there seemed to be some financial turmoil. There, sh there seemed to be some leadership turmoil. There seemed to be maybe even a lack of leadership in the broad nascent cannabis and hemp industry. And so we figured that there was an opportunity to, to look at three integrated offerings. So we advise, we convene, and we invest, uh, specifically in cannabis companies, hemp companies. Um, and the advising that we do is around sustainability. It's around branding and the, the, the convergence of those two. Uh, we use, um, more often than not, what we call, a, and others now refer to as an ESG lens of focus, environmental, social governance lens. And we think that by doing that, it brings a, uh, a sort of a suite of, of 
um, opportunity to an organization to help them stay very focused on their strategy, their operations, and their financial performance. Um, because if they're watching what is material, or is important to their business, from an environmental perspective, a social perspective, and a governance perspective, then they will be better prepared for those eventualities that will happen in any business as you're growing, and that is there will be some setbacks. But they're also better prepared uh, as they grow because they're better prepared to have conversations with the investor community um, in the sense that there's an increasing play in the investor community in the cannabis industry that we're seeing and to some degree we are part of, which is you know the introduction of what we reference as smart money coming into this business. And by smart money, we really are referencing impact investment monies, which more often than not is also where family offices and family office funds reside. And we see that the, 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 the focus of the impact investor and the, and the, the broad funds that they're, that they're bringing into this space is not only on an economic upside, but be sure they do want an economic upside. Uh, this is not some grant, this is not a foundation, this is not some charity. This is an investment, it's a fund. They do want an economic return, but they're as equally uh, interested in uh, a social impact and an environmental impact. And so an ESG framework, from their perspective, when they see that in a target company that they're looking to invest in, that, that's, a, that's a lot of green lights right there, which we think is, is going to herald the way for this smarter money to come into the, the, the broader room, the room that is the cannabis industry, because there are smart ideas and there are smart people and they want to see a better outcome you know, beyond just an economic upside. Hey, Jeff, I, so know, we're harnessing I wanted that. to ask to that point, because I think it's important to note that while the cannabis industry can definitely benefit from this sort of conscious capitalism type approach, ESG, impact investment, um, this is not only a growing trend in cannabis, but it's also a growing trend in the broader investment world, right? So totally. there's, there is an opportunity, mm -hmm. I think, to bring in capital. This year in particular, I've heard from a lot of companies in, in emerging markets saying, hey, capital's dried up. Um, nobody's talking, nothing's happening in 2020. And yet when I talk to impact investors, a lot of times they're saying, yeah, it's, it's some ways the quiet has given us a, a chance to champion this concept overall. Are you hearing the same thing or? Uh, yes, of course. In fact, um, to speak to your point, this is absolutely happening, not only in the cannabis industry, but in other industries. Uh, and I think what we're also witnessing, though, is this, again, the convergence of both the, the build out and the growth of the cannabis and hemp industry, which in turn will be an, uh, a disruptor for many other industries. I mean, you know, hemp has a great opportunity to disrupt the food, the fashion, the fuel industries, ultimately the finance industry when we see the passing of, of the Safe Banking Act uh, upon you know, federal legalization here in the United States. We're going to see a, a, a disruption, I think, within the finance industry that is also fueling a different kind of investor, the impact investor. And mm. uh, uh, we see that in, in these other industries. And, and I, I think that if we look at um, just a recent report, I, I, I'd have to dig out where it came from, and I could do that for listeners and viewers at some point. Um, but from 2018, the total, um, you know, the total amount of capital managed, so professionally managed in the United States, was about 48 trillion dollars, of which 12 wow. trillion. Yeah, that's a that's a big number. That's with a lot of zeros. Yeah. Uh, 12 trillion was was being managed but put into what we call the sustainable responsible impact investment um, world so that's one in every four dollars that was in 2018. a recent report that indicates that in in 2020 as we come to the end of it the the amount of capital that is pr um, managed professionally in the united states goes from 48 to 51. so you can do the the math or maths as i would say 
um, you can do that and you can see what growth there is over a two-year period. But the, the monies that have gone into uh, sustainable, responsible impact investing has gone from 12 to 17 million. So that means that 17 to 51, one in three dollars. That's, that's an increase from one in four. Now one in three dollars of professionally managed money in the US is going into sustainable, responsible impact investing uh, um, you know, um, opportunities. And we see that as, as just a bellwether. You know, we, we, we see more of that happening and, and the interest that we're seeing from impact investors and from family offices who are increasingly uh, seeing the opportunity for them to be uh, funding uh, companies in the cannabis and hemp space because those companies can deliver social impact and environmental impact as well as the economic impact that, they're, that clearly they're seeking. Which is super encouraging since some of these ideas have been talked about for quite a while. But as we've seen, you know, there's been a lot of struggle to actually pass some policies to really address um, environmental issues and keep them at the forefront or at least at the same level of concern for a company as the profit that they're making rather than it being an afterthought. Um, what do you, what do you think is, is driving that or, or who is driving that? Is this, you know, a, a culmination of things? Is this a generational shift? What are your thoughts? Well, that's a great question. And, uh, I, I can say quite clearly, it is not coming from one source. There is no one person or one body that is sort of steering and guiding the way. I, fundamentally what we're seeing here is a multi-stakeholder play happening right in front of us mm -hmm. because we can see the investors and we've already spoken a bit about the investor community if we look at the legal and regulatory perspective you can see already um, from a month ago now just a quick look at the calendar a month ago november 3rd the elections you'd already see a number of states that are now looking to to move into uh, legalization around medical and or recreational cannabis so we're also seeing uh, an appetite for this beyond these borders in Mexico, there's recently been a vote. There are other votes scheduled around the world. We're also seeing the vote yesterday, in fact, not even 24 hours old coming out of the United Nations, where they have addressed uh, the scheduling, of moving off schedule four of, of, of cannabis. This, I think, will herald changes at a national level right around the world certainly if you look at that vote 27 to 25 i think it was one abstention yeah that's correct the 20 yep. the 27 yeses gives a pretty good indication of those countries that are probably going to move ahead with their version of um legalization of the industry yeah and, and so i think that that's great i think it also the fact that that's happening at the un you're seeing movements in the us uh, and in South America, I was even talking to some folks uh, out of the Southern African region a couple of weeks ago for mm -hmm. an interview I did with the Global Cannabis Network Collective. And while they are a little bit further out, you know, they're baking in these social impact, environmental impact regulations into the legislations that they're talking about and actually pitching um, economic development in those countries based on societal impact in front of profit. There are, I do yeah. think we have enough uh, critical mass finally amongst folks that you can viably pull that off uh, and, and get mm -hmm. interest and in, in new, new countries on board uh, with sort of society first, profit second. Acknowledging, of course, that you right. still have to make money to have a business but yeah. um that yeah. i would see as a huge negative harbinger for the mass pharmaceutical industry right <laughs> because if you start yeah um with mm. models like that all of a sudden um the people first profit second kind of model kills some of the profit margins but hopefully gives a foothold for medicinal cannabis worldwide in a way that we haven't seen for some for anything in a long time yeah yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, aside from the other the stakeholders that I mentioned, one of the, the single biggest drivers 
uh, for this change that we're seeing is at a consumer level. We have seven and a half, maybe almost eight billion. We're on track for eight billion people in the world. I think we, if we look at Gen Z and millennials, um, not to forget the older populations who will be impacted by a legalization around medical cannabis more than most because the ailments that this wonderful plant can treat are exactly targeting those who are struggling with you know illnesses and the like that, that typically impact the over 60s but millennials and generation z they're, they're looking quite clearly at, at wanting to be a part of a different world, a world that doesn't look at this sort of mono-capital approach to the way that life plays out, that it, 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 mm -hmm. they don't see that it should be a zero-sum game. There's, a, there's some sort of transaction. You pay, you know, someone wins, someone loses. Increasingly, what they're seeing is a multi-capital approach to a, a different way of life, which is not only to, to focus on economic capital and to speak to that point, you know, again, um, do, making money and doing good are not mutually exclusive. We need to forget that model. We need to think that whoever created that model was probably the same people who got involved in the, the criminalization of, of, of cannabis. There's like some wacky right. thinking going on there. I've got a whole lecture. So, let me just, the industrial. <laughs> yeah. So let me yeah. just say that again. You know, making money and doing good is not mutually exclusive. So if we look at multi-capitals, we look at beyond an economic capital, we look at intellectual capital, human capital, but let's look at social capital and let's look at natural capital. Natural capital, unless we really get on top of the issues facing us around natural capital, meaning the, the, the detriment to the ecosystem, we're not going to have a business because business is, an, is a subset of, of society and society is a subset of, of ecology and the planet and the environment. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 you know, you, there will be a lot of folk out there saying, no, no, I just got to make more money. I just got to make money. I don't care about anybody else. We're all in the same boat. You're all going to go down. So I think that what's happening is we're seeing more and more folks who are seeing we, we do care sufficient about the planet that we, we want to see a different version of business. And I think that's what is appealing. Put on, overlay that, the, the sort of the, the love affair that is, is beginning to flourish around cannabis, it, 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 you, you can see then that this is a, a game changing moment, I think, for, for us, almost a sort of an, an existential occurrence, which we probably wouldn't mm -hmm. see again um, in our lifetime. I, so there's a huge opportunity. I have told a lot of folks um, when asked that cannabis provides a unique opportunity, which I'm not um, even convinced comes around once in a lifetime um it's less frequent than that where we get to build from scratch in a lot of ways a mm -hmm. an industry off of um you know some new ideas which still uh do create very successful business opportunities but in a way that acknowledges return on investment is both monetary mm -hmm. and societal um it's actually the entire premise of the gcnc that we built which is we want to increase knowledge share and deal flow optimization under this notion that if you act sustainably, ethically, and responsibly in how you uh, work with others, you will ultimately lift all boats and ultimately be vastly more successful. And it's been wonderful to see how many uh, truly influential players in the global cannabis market uh, you know, have, have joined on and, and help perpetuate that idea. And I know that's similar to some of what you're talking about at the Regenibus Network as well. Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, we joked a little bit before we came live on air, you guys are going to be super busy. You need to clone yourselves uh, maybe three or four times over because obviously on the back of what's happening with the United Nations and- Well, we can clone Jill. I don't think we board. need more of me, but- <laughs> <laughs> More than Mary. We'll do okay. Um, but, <laughs> But you're absolutely right in terms of yes, uh, of what we're what we're what we're really doing here collectively, and, and I know that um, our two organisations are, are, are just beginning this journey of of going down this road of ensuring a different version of the cannabis industry. 
and the, and the hemp industry. And I think one of the things that, to just go full circle to the initial question and a part of the answer I hadn't yet given, which was around our mission and our vision, is just to bring that back to um, this, this once in a beyond a lifetime opportunity. As we build this industry, we cannot and we should not. It's an imperative that we do not forget those upon whose shoulders this industry has already got out the door. And, and that is, we're talking about people who have been growing marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, whatever name you, you've provided to it. They've been growing this very successfully for a period of time. And there's a tremendous body of knowledge that is in the hearts and minds, hearts and minds of these folk. And we need to not forget. We need to frankly ensure that there is regenerative growth for all, which is basically our strap line. Uh, the strap line, regenerative growth for all in the cannabis industry. And our purpose, the reason we exist, is to ensure the democratization of the opportunity to deliver that. We, we, mm, we must absolutely. make sure being in... that we, we cannot leave folks behind. And that means- Yeah, you know, being intentional about how we it, create this future. Precisely. And, and what we're finding is as another part of the ecosystem, so investors, regulators, the, lo the lawyers, the attorneys, the consumers, but business leaders who are setting out in a purpose-centric way to build out their businesses with the intention of delivering a social impact and environmental impact, and yes, a profit. So good for them that they're that they've they've broken the mold and that they see that you know making money and doing good are no longer mutually exclusive, and this is a big part of what we are heartened to to see. In fact, when we Patrick and I were at um, MJ BizCon, which is exactly a year ago this this time we were in Vegas, and I just it was my first time at MJ BizCon, and it was like it was huge. I was like, oh my god, I walked around and I was like looking at all these companies and I was trying to have conversations with people about sustainability and I was drawing a blank and I was thinking, oh, wow, I wonder. But then it hit me that there is a huge opportunity. And then I started finding folks who were very, very interested in this intentional model of building out their businesses in a just way. And I think that's what we're really bringing to, to the fore. We see that Again, smart money, smart people, smart ideas. And, and so we're heartened by mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. We, we see that as a big play. Yeah, there's a really beautiful metaphor with cannabis as an opportunity to be a regenerative industry that um, rebuilds and gives back and kind of lifts all boats um, while still, you know, providing a uh, profit in how the metaphor in terms of how you know when you plant hemp it gives back to the soil it gives back nutrients to the soil and so it's it becomes um you know more of a virtuous cycle rather mm -hmm. than the vicious vicious cycle that we were discussing earlier with that the mono capitalism ideas yeah. so it's um really an exciting point to be at right now where we have the opportunity as an industry to be intentional and in how we want to create mm -hmm. the future lift all boats, reach back and uh, lift up the people who have been disenfranchised in so many ways. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here, which is yeah. just so exciting. Oh, I think it's you've nailed it. And I, and I think, you know, to speak to that, the difference, which is another question you asked earlier, which I hadn't forgotten, I was just waiting for the right time to the difference between from our perspective, sustainability and regenerative approach is that we kind of look at regeneration and re a regenerative industry and a, a regenerative approach as almost being like sustainability 3.0. It's, it's, it's looking back, we realized that it was great to have focus around a triple bottom line of uh, impact and effect. So people, planet, profit. The, the, the problem I think stems with sustainability in as much as that it, all it really does is just brings us back to perhaps where we have come from and where we have come from isn't not isn't necessarily the best place so what regenerative and a regenerative approach does it kind of says we need to go beyond just 
making good what we have what we have done and what we have you know impacted from an environmental or social perspective we need to go beyond that and i think that the best example of that and to to sort of build on the the hemp story is to look at regenerative agriculture you know because the the whole notion of the industrial agricultural machine has made some folk pretty wealthy that's an understatement but for sure not an understatement it has made some people the majority pretty miserable they they are being left behind and it is damaging our, our environment it's damaging our ecosystem etc and we look at you know specifically like monocropping vast swathes of land that, that just use a single crop that are a detriment ultimately to the soil health and then add on top of that mechanical and chemical you know uh influences we need to stop doing that we don't need to just go back to well less of that we need to stop doing that we need to go back to uh a a version of agriculture that is that replenishes the land it is it harnesses the things that we want to see in society but can also create sufficient economic upside for everyone and i think that's what we, we we need to be looking at if we don't get that right then the topsoil in the united states will disappear within 60 years and you, you can grow nothing in this country as a result of that hemp as a phytoremediator so as a plant that remediates soil that can take out heavy metals from the soil can actually help the health of the soil looking then at a at a, a sort of a multi-crop approach and and planting hemp cannabis in different parts of vast swathes of land while still growing wheat while still growing corn is a far more um i would say uh, uh it's, it's a better approach for humanity and for the planet and and frankly we should be moving to that and then you could say well let's look at other industries regenerative fashion imagine what that would be if we could just get our heads around some of the materials certainly hemp which you know ultimately could replace cotton i mean levi's made their first jeans out of hemp 100 plus years ago yep so i think i did not know that the, yeah uh, so the opportunity to go back there is is great the, the, the trick that they have is is to is to use the, the correct techniques to do that rather than looking at so what they've done thus far is, is, is great, but it could be better. Yeah. Let me just leave it at that. Hey, Jeff, you know, this discussion on how we do uh, regenerative uh, crops and um, cultivation and all that is actually, um, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because in one of the next uh, upcoming episodes, we're talking to um, some farmers from Israel who are continuing to optimize uh, their cultivation practices and helping to, you know, not only maximize crops and all that, but also make sure that it's done in a responsible way and helping to educate other farmers through their technology on how to do that. So, um, and you gave me a great idea. I need to go and find some folks. Uh, two years ago at a conference in Paris, I remember talking to somebody that was looking at regenerative fashion. I need to hunt them down and, and see sort of where that is, but- um, Yeah, well, go, well, we can go offline. I can give you some some names uh, of folks because we are we are definitely seeing regenerators across multiple industries. Yeah. And uh, that's a great thing. And it takes that people, planet, profit idea, like directly to heart to the things that people at all levels of the supply chain and end consumers can really touch, see and understand uh, where it's coming from. So, you know, we, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask one more wow. question around, um, you know, if, if we've got cannabis companies all around the world, uh, in, you know, Peru and Ecuador and Brazil and Australia and Germany and Italy and, uh, North Macedonia and all of them at this point, because it's a fairly new industry have similar challenges around accessing financing, accessing capital to be able to scale their businesses. And so we've, we've talked this nice game about impact dollars, but if you are one of these companies, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you find access to capital like that to say, Hey, 
I, I believe in all these ideas that they've been talking about, but I have no idea who to ask. Obviously now they can come to you but and ask that question, but generally speaking, like how do we champion this notion amongst the companies themselves? Well, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a great question. I think that there is a huge opportunity for the universe of impact investors and family offices to create um, a plethora of, of online events, virtual events, et cetera, to really put themselves front and center to say, we are here. This is the kind of thing we want to invest in. The, the, this, is the, the, this is not only our investment thesis, but this is also our impact thesis. And let's spend as much time talking about the impact thesis as we're talking about the investment thesis. And I, and I think that if, if we could set about doing that and, and, and move around the world, uh, for sure, uh, although I referenced in those two reports, those numbers were coming from the United States, there is a sizable uh, chunk of in, impact investor money and family office money outside of the US. In fact, the total as I understand in 2019, the total was 40% of it was in the United States. So the rest of it is, is, is out there. Yep. So it's, it, this is not, it is quite interesting. I think most people think that impact investors, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that's those nice people in, in the United States. They're everywhere yeah. <laughs> and increasing. Um, and Actually, that's a good sign. There's, there's many yeah. more outside the U S than there are inside, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but I also, yeah. um, yeah, you know, this triggers an idea. We, the GCNC and Regenimus are already tight. Um, offline, I, I believe in action and um, it's a good time to be planning for 2021. So let's make that happen. I, I think it's, it's time to do that. Um, so listeners, be mm -hmm. ready. Uh, we're gonna figure out how to pull some of that off and, and take this kind of message out to companies around the world to, to help um, fund and grow yeah. impact-minded organizations. I think it's a great mission and a great thing that you're doing, Jeff. I really appreciate wow. um, you coming on with us and taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And, I, and seriously, we're very, very much lo looking forward to all the do action that we're going to be doing with you guys. So. Perfect. So all I'm right. right back at you. Yep. Well, thank you very much. 2021. Here we come. <laughs> yes. Thanks all. And um, <laughs> tune in next time for International Cannabis Conversations. Thanks for tuning in and uh, look forward to the next one where we'll be exploring in detail um, more of these kinds of topics. <laughs>